Okay, good morning, everybody. I know we still have a lot of people kind of filing in, but wanted to get started so we don't get too far off track uh, on timing. Uh, welcome to CSIS. My name is Sarah Ladislaw. I'm a Senior Vice President and Director of the Energy and National Security Program. Really pleased to see so many people here today uh, and watching online for what we uh, are really pleased to say is the start of a six-part series uh, called the Climate Solutions Series. I'm um, going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but because we take your security very seriously, I am uh, obligated to remind everybody to just familiarize yourself with the emergency exits. We don't anticipate any kind of uh, emergency or incident, but want you to be uh, aware of your surroundings just in case. So today's event uh, is on deep decarbonization pathways, and as I mentioned, it's part of a series that we've started called the Climate Solutions Series, which is designed to look at how the world pursues different options for getting to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, the target, or, or shortly thereafter, somewhere around 2050. Uh, th these are the targets that the uh, scientific community and the policy community have uh, endorsed and are increasingly uh, trying to achieve in terms of being able to manage uh, the impacts of climate change and put the, the world on a more sustainable trajectory uh, in terms of our emissions path way. Um, it is a very complicated set of issues. We tend to throw terminology about deep decarbonization pathways out a lot. And with so much policy evolution going on, so much technological change, so much going on that's changing the business environment, we thought we would spend a good portion of 2020 getting into the details of what it means to actually try to deeply decarbonize uh, the global economy. Now, that being said, we are going to, for the, the rest of this series, be, be taking a sector-by-sector -sector approach. So the next session we'll look at is the electric power sector, then we'll look at transportation, we'll look at the building sector, we'll probably look at, uh, excuse me, we'll look at the ind industrial sector, and then we'll look at carbon, carbon management technologies, including carbon capture and sequ sequestration and direct air capture. Um, we'll probably also, uh, because of the importance, as you'll hear later today, uh, this morning, uh, also be looking at land use uh, issues related uh, to decarbonization as well, even though that's not something we've typically uh, focused on in this program. Uh, while we're going to be doing this sector-by-sector -sector approach, it's really important to recognize, uh, and, and part of the reason why we decided to kick off with the Deep Decarbonization Pathways se uh, session, uh, is that really you need to think about this on a systems integration uh, perspective, right? These sectors don't operate independent of each other, uh, and they probably will operate less dependently of each other in a deeply decarbonized scenario. So we could think of no better person to bring in to walk us through what a deep decarbonization pathway looks like uh, other than Jim Williams, who uh, has been here before but for some private workshops uh, here at CSIS. Uh, Jim is an associate professor at the University of San Francisco. Uh, he uh, also uh, was uh, formerly chief scientist at Energy and Environmental Economics. Um, E3's analysis was a big part, it uh, played a big role in uh, California's plans to deeply decarbonize. Um, he also uh, directs the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, which is a consortium uh, of 16 uh, teams from the highest emitting countries around the world, has played a really inf uh, informing role in the uh, UNFCCC uh, Paris Climate Agreement uh, sort of process. Jim's a true expert in thinking about not only what deep decarbonization paths can look like, but also what, uh, as, as sort of different technologies advance at different rates and scales, as different economies try to pursue uh, deep decarbonization, what some of the variables are that determine the pathways uh, that we might be on or available for different economies to pursue. Another thing that we want to do today uh, is after Jim gives a presentation and we have some discussion about those pathways, uh, is to have a panel discussion about what this means at different levels of government. So what does it mean for a country to want to deeply decarbonize? How is that different from if a state wants to deeply decarbonize? Uh, and what do we know about deep decarbonization efforts at the city uh, level as well? So we've got three excellent presentations, one uh, from Fiona Clowder, who's a climate diplomat uh, from the UK Foreign uh, Commonwealth Office, and she is uh, serving as a, a, a diplomat for the UK efforts in advance of COP26. And she's gonna talk about how the UK is pursuing some of their policies. 
Uh, then we're going to have Ryan Jones, who also uh, will, uh, works with Jim and is a co-founder of Evolved Energy Research. And he's going to talk about the experiences that we've seen in U.S. states uh, and some of the things that U.S. states have to consider if they want to pursue a deeply decarbonized pathway or a net zero by 2050 emissions target. And then finally, we've got Bruno Sardo, who's the president of CDP North America. CDP, as many of you know, works with states uh, and companies on their uh, low carbon and uh, uh, decarbonization strategies. And he's going to talk about some of the work that they do at the city level uh, and sort of the unique uh, aspects of cities who are trying to deeply decarbonize uh, as well. So we look forward to a really excellent discussion. This is live uh, and it's being webcast. So please, uh, uh, if you are going to engage in conversation, which we hope to get to a lot of today, We'll uh, encourage you to use the microphone uh, uh, so that we can engage our audience online as well. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Jim to get us started. And uh, thank you again all for joining us. Um, thank you, Sarah. And thanks to everybody for coming. Let's see if I can. Do I need to point this? Ah, so, um, uh, so uh, uh, note that the uh, results that I'll be talking about today are very recent. Um, uh, they're just now in submission to a journal for publication. So these are draft results. Uh, along with my colleagues, Ryan Jones just introduced, Ben Haley, and uh, Margaret Torn from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, some of you may be familiar with our earlier work on deep decarbonization pathways in California published in 2012 and for the U.S. as a whole published in 2014. Our focus was on reducing emissions 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050, a target adopted by many jurisdictions uh, at that time uh, for as consistent with limiting global warming to 2 degrees C. Our questions were, is it technically feasible to do that, and is it affordable? And our answers were, yes, it is feasible with existing technology, and yes, it can be done at a net cost of about 2% of GDP. Since that time, uh, the IPCC 1.5 degree report raised awareness about the dangers of exceeding that level of global warming. It also showed that global climate models are in broad agreement that remaining below 1.5 C requires net global CO2 emissions to reach zero by about 2050 and to become negative after that. As a consequence, many jurisdictions have adopted the steeper emissions reduction target of carbon neutrality by mid-century. The work I'm describing today asks what achieving carbon neutrality by 2050 requires in terms of changes in infrastructure, the cost of different pathways, what the key challenges are, and what policy needs to accomplish. Our focus uh, in the research is on energy and industrial, or ENI, CO2, that is the carbon dioxide from fossil fuel used in energy and industrial processes and feedstocks, which together constitute more than 80 percent of current U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. We were also concerned with the details of how a carbon neutral system would work, how reliability is maintained in a high renewables electricity system, the production of low carbon fuels, um, how to decarbonize end uses that are hard to electrify, uh, like industrial processes and materials, long distance freight, and aviation, and how carbon capture utilization and storage um, would be integrated into the energy system. Uh, we perform this analysis using software models developed for this pur purpose by my colleagues Ryan Jones and Ben Haley at Evolved Energy. One is an energy system model and scenario analysis tool called Energy Pathways. The other is an optimal capacity expansion model for electricity and fuels called RIO. Together they simulate the energy system in great temp temporal, spatial, and sectoral detail about 140 sectors, annual and hourly time steps, 16 regions of the United States. As with our earlier work, if you're familiar with that, 
uh, we developed carbon neutral scenarios and compared them with a BAU reference scenario based on the Department of Energy's annual energy outlook on cost, emissions, and infrastructure requirements. We use the same DOE projections of population, GDP, and demand for energy services in all the scenarios. The carbon neutral pathway that we found to be lowest cost, we called the central case. We performed sensitivity analysis on this case using a range of high and low fossil fuel prices and technology cost. We also developed scenarios that embody different concerns and aspirations that have emerged in the scholarly uh, discourse and the public conversation. These include limits on the amount of land available for renewable energy and transmission siting, uh, on the amount of biomass that can be sustainably produced, uh, and on how fast consumers adopt low carbon technologies. We also developed one scenario in which 100% of primary energy comes from renewables and a scenario in which conservation leads to lower demand for energy services, representing a significant behavior change. Finally, we developed a scenario that reaches negative 500 million tons of CO2 per year by 2050 at least cost. This scenario is consistent with the atmospheric drawdown trajectory to 350 ppm by the end of the, uh, the century as uh, discussed in the work of Jim Hansen. Uh, this shows the emissions trajectories for the reference and central cases. Uh, on the left is annual emissions, on the right is cumulative emissions. The black line in each case is net emissions, which are gross emissions minus the carbon that is sequestered geologically or in durable products. Um, for the, the reference case shows a slight decline over time. For the carbon neutral case, annual net emissions follow a straight line trajectory to zero in 2050. Um, you'll notice looking at the cumulative emissions that um, uh, about half of the total emissions over the time period occur over the next decade. And so going at a slower decarbonization rate than a straight line uh, means that you would end up either with higher cumulative emissions, which are the thing that matter for climate over the same time period, or you would have to go much more deeply into negative emissions to compensate for it. Uh, the transition from a high carbon to a low carbon energy system is based on three main strategies, using energy more efficiently, decarbonizing electricity, and switching from fuel combustion and end uses to electricity. Um, this shows benchmark values for these. So per capita energy use uh, declines by 40%, um, and with that energy intensity of GP, uh, declines by two-thirds. The carbon intensity of electricity uh, declines by 95 percent, while electricity's share of end-use energy triples from 20 percent to 60 percent. Now, reaching uh, net zero or net negative uh, emissions, including um, uh, requires an additional strategy, which is carbon capture, and this ranges from 400 to about 1,000 uh, million uh, uh, tons per, of CO2 per year, uh, up from negligible levels today. Uh, and this is maybe the time to remind everyone that we're not talking about forecast here. This is not a projection. This is backcasting. We're working back from the question, what does it take to get to carbon neutrality? This is not saying uh, that we assume this will happen. This is something that we would have to make happen, obviously. Um, uh, the next three slides illustrate the energy system transformation resulting from these strategies. and I. Apologize for the small text. I'll try to um, make clear what I'm talking about here. This figure uh, called a Sankey diagram shows the current energy system of the U.S. Uh, it shows energy flow through the U.S. economy from primary energy input on the left through conversion processes in the middle to end uses on the right, and the line widths are proportional to the, to the amount of energy. Uh, now we're going to look at two carbon neutral scenarios. Uh, 
um, the 100% renewable primary energy case and the central case with a low fossil fuel price sensitivity. Um, so the things to look at here um, are uh, the form of final energy that's being used in end uses. So uh, let's go back to the, uh, to the current system for a second. So what you can see here, there's grid electricity uh, going mostly into buildings. Here's natural gas uh, in the pipeline going to buildings and into industry. Uh, and here is petroleum uh, that is mostly used in transportation. That should be very familiar to people. What happens in a decarbonized system is uh, the amount of grid electricity at one of the three pillars is going to be uh, greatly increased to uh, satisfy uh, the electrification of many loads that currently use fuels. Uh, so there will be a lot less fuel use. In this case, about one quarter of the current level of petroleum use. Um, uh, there's also electrification of buildings, and so there's a lot less uh, natural gas use. In this case, about 30% of the current level of natural gas use. There's no coal whatsoever. And so, again, going back to the current system, here's a system that is on the left-hand side dominated by um, by coal, natural gas, and petroleum. And here is a system uh, in which the place of those has largely been taken by uh, solar, wind, and biomass. Um, in, uh, I'm showing the low fossil fuel price sensitivity because this is the, um, of all the scenarios that we developed, the one that has the highest residual use of fossil fuels. And those uh, were chosen by the model on the basis of fossil fuels being cheap. Um, and so the uses that these residual uh, fuels are applied for are for applications that require fuels and are difficult to electrify. So uh, the petroleum is used in, uh, in, uh, in long distance freight, in aviation uh, applications like that, natural gas. Uh, in industrial uh, applications uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, to some extent power generation. Uh, here is the 100% primary renewable energy case. And uh, what you see here is that there is no fossil fuel at all. That was definitional. That was a constraint on the case. Um, and uh, uh, all of the primary energy is coming from uh, uh, wind, uh, uh, solar, uh, a little bit of hydro, and biomass. You still need fuels in this case, and so the conversion processes um, uh, are uh, a big part of this energy economy, the production of hydrogen from which uh, uh, substitute uh, hydrocarbon fuels can be synthesized, the use of biomass to create uh, drop-in fuel substitutes become a very big part of this particular uh, economy. One other thing to note in comparison to the central case, if you look at the widths of the solar and wind uh, primary energy inputs on the upper left-hand side and compare them to uh, this 100% primary renewable case, you need a lot more uh, renewable energy input precisely because that's one of the things you're using to synthesize fuels. And so it's not to meet the, uh, the uh, regular end uses, but to provide uh, a substitute uh, fuel since you're not using uh, even residual amounts of fossil fuels. So um, uh, to achieve these outcomes, that was a 2050 set of snapshots I just showed you, to achieve that kind of energy system uh, entails an infrastructure transition over the next three decades that implements those, uh, those four um, uh, pillar strategies I referred to. Um, high emitting, low efficiency, and fossil fuel consuming technologies are largely replaced with lo low emitting, high efficiency, and electricity consuming uh, technologies. This figure illustrates uh, 
this transition for three sectors that together comprise more than two-thirds of current energy industrial CO2 emissions, electric power generation, vehicles, and heating and buildings. So by 2050, um, generation capacity increases by 3,000 gigawatts. It's currently uh, 1,000, and virtually all of this increase is wind and solar. Coal generation is fully retired. That's this left-hand figure. Um, uh, in the center, vehicle stocks, uh, light-duty vehicles on the top. Um, uh, uh, out of 280 million cars and light trucks forecast uh, by the DOE, more than 270 million are battery electric vehicles replacing internal combustion vehicles. Out of 18 million uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles, uh, more than 14 million are battery or fuel cell electric. In ele residential buildings uh, on the right hand side, electric heat pumps, um, uh, constitute 120 million out of 140 million space heating units and 80 million out of 150 million water heating units with electric resistance heating uh, uh, comprising most of the remainder. Um, this figure illustrates how these three, how the three decarbonization strategies work together in the case of light duty vehicles, which is cars and light trucks and SUVs. First, uh, electrification. So on the left hand two slides, you see electrification at work. Uh, on the far left, you see uh, the sales share. Again, this is backcasting. This isn't a forecast, but this is what you need to do if you're going to follow this straight line net emissions trajectory. Um, this is the the blue is uh, electric vehicles. The the gray is uh, internal combustion vehicles, and so. Um, this is the rate at which the sales share has to uh, increase in order to achieve a vehicle stock that by mid-century is basically close to 100% electric vehicles. That's the electrification uh, pillar. The next is the energy efficiency pillar under the, the, the third figure, energy. Um, uh, Electric vehicles are so much more thermodynamically efficient than internal combustion engines that the total energy requirement is reduced by almost three quarters from today, despite an increase in vehicle miles traveled per the annual energy outlook. And then finally, uh, there's the electricity decarbonization dimension. The emissions figure shows that the decreased um, energy use in combination with nearly fully decarbonized electricity reduces overall emissions to uh, a tiny residual. Um, this shows the net cost of reaching carbon neutrality for the central case. Um, amounts above the zero line are uh, are greater than the reference case and amounts below our avoided cost. Um, the net cost is the black line. And so uh, it is uh, here $72 billion in 2050 or about 0.2% of forecast GDP in that year. Um, the net cost is the result of a large swing in gross cost, so about 925 billion more is spent on efficient and low carbon technology, but this enables spending about 150 billion dollars less on fossil fuels. Um, this is a remarkable result, um, the 0.2 percent, given that a few years ago many analysts, including ourselves, um, calculated a net cost of about 2 percent of GDP for uh, the 80 by 50 target, which is obviously much less ambitious than carbon neutrality. And this change is driven mainly by ongoing cost decreases in solar, wind, and electric vehicles. It demonstrates why continuing to update uh, these analyses using the most recent data uh, is important. Um, this shows net cost for the central lowland net negative delayed electrification and 100% renewable scenario as you as you go up. 
Um, the cost of the constrained cases is higher than the central case because if some key resource is limited, higher cost substitutes are required. Uh, the highest cost scenario here is the 100% renewable primary energy at about 0.8% of GDP in 2050. The delayed electrification case is a little more than uh, half a percent. Ironically, it requires more electricity when you can't use the electricity directly in electrified end uses because you have to supply fuels. And so uh, we have to do more build out of the electricity system for fuel synthesis. And then the net negative case um, right there in the yellow line, uh, without resource constraints, uh, the least cost version is uh, less than 0.5% of GDP. Um, this shows energy spending as a share of GDP. Total spending on energy in our modeled scenarios are on the right side and, uh, uh, of, the, of the blue vertical line, and historical spending is on the left side. Uh, the lowest of the modeled lines, that black line there, uh, is the BAU reference case, and the others um, are, are the cases you saw on the previous slide. The highest cost case is still near the low end of historical energy costs to the U.S. economy. Um, and I should uh, cop something here. This is a draft, and one thing that we uh, have not yet corrected on this is that we don't have energy taxes in the modeled results. And so uh, if you can sort of uh, mentally shift those modeled results up about a percent of GDP, it would be, uh, it would be closer to the reality. Uh, we will be adjusting that, but we didn't have a chance for today's talk. Um, but uh, it still makes the point that compared to historical uh, variations um, uh, that were driven by uh, volatile uh, oil prices primarily, uh, we're still at the, the low end of what uh, people have spent for energy historically in the U.S. economy uh, doing uh, a carbon neutral transition. Um, this is an energy economy, speaking of high oil prices, that is not vulnerable to oil price shocks because oil is such a small share of the economy, at most about 25% of today's level. This is an economy with manufactured energy, um, which should not be subject to price shocks, assuming some care about having substitutes available for strategic materials. The overall story about um, about the energy economy is that viewed from many angles and for many different pathways, cost per se is not a barrier to achieving carbon neutrality by mid-century. Now there, of course, are those big swings in where the money goes, and that uh, leads to a political economy question that I won't talk about today, but uh, it, I think is evident to everyone here. Um, the uh, least cost electricity system gets most of its energy from wind and solar, uh, uh, and such a system requires a multi-pronged approach to the problem of balancing supply and demand um, in real time more so than conventional systems. Uh, but the least cost way to provide reliable capacity to meet demand in all hours of the year is with thermal generation, uh, mostly uh, gas combustion turbines and combined cycle turbines. Um, there is um, uh, on the order of uh, five or six hundred uh, gigawatts of gas generation in the system in 2050 in these carbon neutral systems comparable to um, the, the natural gas fleet today in, uh, in magnitude. Um, note, however, um, on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, the falling capacity factors. These are not operated very often, only about 5% of the hours uh, in the year on, on average um, uh, in order to, 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 to provide reliable capacity. Uh, nuclear and fossil generation with carbon capture and storage are not economic in this role. Um, uh, you have to spend too much upfront capital cost for something that you're only running 5% of the time. Uh, and they also can't compete with renewables for supplying bulk energy except when renewables are constrained. 
Um, so the most economic solution in most cases is to burn natural gas and offset it elsewhere. In the 100% uh, renewable primary energy case, there is no fossil natural gas, so decarbonized gas is used in the gas generators. Um, uh, building sufficient wind and solar for high load periods means that there will be overgeneration and low load periods both within a day and over the course of a year. Um, so, uh, so what do you do with that? Well, some amount of renewable curtailment is always economic, but too much is uneconomic. Um, so one thing uh, you do is expand transmission capacity. Uh, the central case has about an 80% increase in interregional uh, transmission capacity, mostly going from the wind belt in the middle of the United States uh, toward, uh, toward the south and, and east. Um, uh, another is to add around 200 gigawatts of batteries for diurnal balancing, uh, short-term balancing, shifting uh, solar, for example, from one part of the day to another. Uh, then there are flexible loads uh, to address long-duration energy surpluses, periods of days to month. And two important ones are hydrogen production for, for fuel synthesis and dual fuel boilers that can use excess electricity uh, when available. Um, uh, about 60% of end uses can be electrified as we understand it with, with, with existing technologies. Uh, and that means that the other 40% of end use energy has to be supplied with fuels. Um, there are three strategies for meeting fuel demand in a carbon neutral system. Uh, uh, maximizing energy efficiency and conservation, to limit the demand, drop in carbon neutral fuels, and capturing or offsetting uh, the CO2 from fuel combustion. Um, the the drop-in fuels um, basically have three sources uh, as shown here. One is um, they're synthesized starting with uh, using electricity uh, to um, uh, to produce hydrogen and then uh, go on from there to synthesize fuels. A second one is biomass, and a final one is uh, fossil fuels with carbon capture. And while we're on the topic of carbon capture, it is required in all cases, even the 100% uh, renewable primary energy case, which is shown uh, here in uh, the middle of these three figures. Um, and uh, uh, the, the point is that the carbon that is captured is used to create um, uh, liquid and gaseous fuels. It is all utilized, there is no sequestration. But uh, in the process of using biomass in that scenario, uh, you end up with a sort of unintended negative emission. So actually the 100% primary renewable case has about minus 350 million tons of CO2 per year um, uh, of, of negative emissions as a consequence. Uh, on the far right hand side is the central case with the low fossil fuel price sensitivity as I mentioned uh, uh, before. Uh, that's the one that has um, uh, the most fossil fuel in it, and therefore you see the gray here in this bottom right figure, that is sequestered carbon. Uh, you have to put it in the ground and you also have to extract some from the air and you have to do some, uh, some uh, uh, sequestration of uh, CO2 from biomass refining to get negative emissions to counteract the fossil fuels that you use. So, um, uh, The scale and pace of infrastructure build drives competition among environmental, economic, and social priorities as demonstrated by our cases. In the lim limited land and biomass case, more natural gas and carbon sequestration are required. Uh, the only case where nuclear expansion is economic. Uh, with delayed electrification, as I mentioned, ironically, you have greater use uh, it requires more electricity and greater use of electric fuels, biofuels, and therefore land. In the 100% primary renewable energy case, this one has the highest demand for electric fuels, biofuels, and land. 
Um, and the high conservation case has less infrastructure and land but requires uh, major behavior change. So to summarize our findings, uh, uh, carbon neutrality uh, in the energy and industrial system by 2050 is achievable at a net cost of 0.2% of GDP, not counting the benefits of avoided climate change and pollution. Um, the least cost energy system is organized around high renewables electricity driven by ongoing cost declines in wind and solar plus electrification. And measures required over the next 10 years uh, to rapidly move toward this system are well understood and they're also consistent across the pathways. The pathways start to diverge uh, after 2030, uh, in the mid-2030s, really. And so the required actions, and this is my last slide, the required actions in this decade uh, are shown here with some, with some benchmarks. Um, if we want to be on the straight line path, now some of these might not be achieved. The point is, uh, if you don't achieve them and you have to do uh, other things uh, later on to get to carbon uh, neutrality in 2050 is going to cost more. Um, and it may have other impacts as well. But anyway, solar and wind capacity, uh, three and a half times the current level by 2030. Coal generation, uh, basically less than 1% of total generation on its way to complete retirement. Um, electric light duty vehicles, 50% of sales by 2030. Uh, for medium duty, it's 40%. For heavy duty, it's 30% by 2030. Heat pumps in buildings, 50% uh, of sales by 2030. Uh, uh, energy storage, about 20 gigawatts of batteries uh, by that time. No new oil and gas uh, transport facilities. Those are going to become stranded assets in a um, uh, carbon neutral economy. Maintain the existing uh, nuclear fleet to the extent feasible and maintain gas generating capacity at its current level, which might mean <coughs> retirement and replacement, but uh, the same levels of capacity. So, thank you very much. So we'll have Ryan come up to the stage uh, as well for questions. I, we have about 15 minutes. I think you should stay there because then you can see the people over there uh, a little bit better. Um, I want to get as many audience questions in as possible. So I'm going to group a couple of the ones that I had just to quickly um, uh, uh, try and uh, get to, to a, a specific set of issues. Jim, you, you've mentioned that you've been doing this for a while. Um, for those of us who uh, have been looking at these types of analyses for a while, and for people who are brand new, it's always amazing to see the scope and the scale and the pace of change that it requires about a lot of fundamental industries, you know, uh, uh, sec uh, industries in our economy. Over the period of time that you've been doing this, where have you seen, you mentioned sort of cost declines on solar and renewables, the things that have really sort of changed the nature of how you've been doing these you know, systems level forecasts. Where are there places, whether it's in the private sector or in the policy side of the equation, where you see real change occurring today that might sort of, you know, that, that, that you would characterize as being sort of pioneering or leading in, in the areas where we need to see the most change. So could you just characterize some of that activity a little bit? Sure, but I'll let Brian take, people might be tired of hearing my voice. You want to take a shot at that, Ryan? <laughs> sure. You can give me the hard questions, Jim. Yep. Um, you know, <clears throat> we mentioned uh, vehicles and renewables as kind of the big things on the, on the, on the technology side. Within that kind of same time frame, and Jim alluded to this on one of his early slides, you know, four years ago we were talking about 80-50 goals, and now we're talking about net zero goals with, with gross emission reductions on a state level that are even kind of more ambitious. And I think there's, there's been a kind of a re-emphasis on the state level of energy system transformation as opposed to uh, kind of buying fuels from out of state or importing zero carbon energy from out of state, which I have found to be, you know, very encouraging in terms of the overall policy framework that we're looking at this problem. So, you know, going from, you know, clean development mechanisms in Kyoto where, you know, you're trying to get offsets from outside of your jurisdiction to actually 
kind of internalizing the, the fact that there's, an, there's a t real transformation in the energy system that needs to happen locally, I think that's a really positive change that you know, we've seen in the last four years here. And anything, be very careful on that edge. Uh, uh, yeah. Anything on the private sector side of things? Well, uh, I think we're seeing the, you know, a lot of, uh, this is a California-centric perspective, but obviously the, over the last 10 years, we've gone from um, a little bit of activity to an enormous amount of activity, and um, we're seeing competition now in many of these different areas. I think that is actually one of our, one of our uh, follow-on points, maybe you'll bring this up um, in the later discussion, but uh, uh, there's a lot of private sector dynamism. It's really important in policy to set up the right kinds of competition. An uh, example of something that's not the right kind of competition was in the Clean Power Plan, where you could substitute for low carbon generation by doing energy efficiency. There was a certain paradigm in which that makes sense, but in, a, but in a sort of three pillars paradigm, it doesn't make any sense. You need to, to, to have sort of electric technologies compete with electric technologies and so forth and so on. Just, just to mention one other thing, you know, I think one thing that's been unique in the last two years is we've seen, um, we've started to see more private country, companies get out ahead of policy and actually, wait, you know, take Excel Energy in Colorado um, in the Midwest, you know, for example, where they've they made a pledge for carbon neutrality before, you know, the new Colorado governor came in and passed a law, and and I think that's really unique. It speaks to some of the cost results that we found, where um, you know this transition is basically far more cost effective than we thought it was going to be five years ago. Even though we haven't had a lot of progress uh, on the policy level nationally. Uh, you know, technology and subnationals, which I think we'll talk about next, you know, have, have progressed quite a bit. Yeah. I, I, so, so just to reinforce that point, the, the, the fact that so much has happened in the last three plus years in what's perceived to be sort of a hostile federal policy environment on the ground from the bottom up, both on the private sector side and, and at the state level and at the, at the municipal level as well. I think that's a really encouraging sign and that also is a big change. There's not sort of dependency on something big happening uh, in, in this town. Um, it's, it's really, as Ryan said, a question of taking responsibility for your own jurisdiction. So one final question from me and I, then we'll collect a few from the audience. Jim, you've mentioned that in the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, you've done this for a number of different countries. Do the, the sort of shape, the political economy, the, the sort of industrial base of a country sort of predetermine where it may end up or where it may start on these deep decarbonization pathways? You mentioned the divergence really doesn't happen until, you know, post-2030 in the U.S. context. Is it different for different countries? Well, more on the initial side than on the final side. Um, obviously, there's a lot of diversity in the energy mixes and also, of course, in the level of economic development of different countries and all that has to be taken into account. But at the end of the day, those, those four principles that I talked about, that comes down to physics and chemistry and, uh, and, uh, and whatever system you end up has to abide by that, whatever local resources it might take advantage of. Maybe, maybe you're in a country with you know, immense hydro resources. There are such countries, so, uh, so they might have a different energy mix than the one we're talking about. But still, by and large, it's the same story. Great, great. Okay, why don't you two come and you can sit. I'm gonna take a couple questions from the audience. Um, if you could, we'll take three questions uh, at a time. Name and affiliation, question in the form of a question would be great. We can start uh, right back here. Hi, I'm John Morton. I'm an independent climate finance consultant. And I'm curious uh, about some of the assumptions on the economic implications and the feedback loop between the innovation required to achieve the, um, the, uh, the drawdowns and the, and the decarbonization that you've, you've, you've shown there. Obviously, we're selling these, um, uh, these technologies into a global market, so the U.S. isn't in, in isolation. So my question is, to what extent does the U.S. posture, the leadership role that it takes in the various scenarios, have a feedback loop to the job creation, et cetera, here in the U.S.? And to what extent is that modeled into the calculations? And I'm going to take three, so just hold on to that one. Uh, well, do you yawn over there? I'm Jan Maris with Resources of the Future. 
to what extent has the pace of change of an industry been as rapid as I think you're expecting in the reference case? Do we have any historical basis for that? Uh, thank you for presentation. I'm uh, Kinori Kahata and I'm from Japan. And I'm very interested in uh, what kind of job will be increased uh, if uh, this uh, idea or scenario or a central scenario. I think many American people work at uh, oil and gas industries and they concerned about uh, they will lose the job. And uh, I think the scenario needs a lot dynamic policy change, but uh, we need uh, support from oil and gas industries people. So we have to show what kind of job will be increased. And uh, yeah, so is there any analysis of the real job? So job kind of job increases will there be? Three questions, one about economics, one about technology, one about jobs, we covered life. Um, so on the, um, the driving of technology um, in the deep decarbonization pathways project, and this was a few years ago, um, uh, one exercise that we did was a global learning curve exercise where we took the cost projections of each of the 16 country teams, who all operated independently, by the way, um, and looked at what would, would the expected cost be for the things that you've seen, the, the low carbon power generation, the, the vehicles, the, the heat pumps, all that sort of stuff. And then we compared that to a case where we assumed that there was some sort of learning curve associated with the size of the market and we aggregated all those results together and said, what would your cost assumptions be if you weren't sort of an island doing this within your own country and a, a sort of global price taker, but rather, uh, rather you were part of a big global market. And the result was that the overall estimated cost decreased by half. Um, and so we, we don't model that ourselves. We're taking our future cost assumptions from sort of uh, well-known public sources like the Department of Energy and National Academy studies. And they have their own, I think, fairly conservative uh, approach to, to, uh, to future costs. But the point is extremely well taken. The, the, the maybe one of the biggest uh, contributions that the United States can make on the global stage is to lead in innovation but also to lead in adoption and help create the global markets that will bring the prices down. I, I, I think we all celebrate the role of, of Germany and Spain um, in bringing down the cost of photovoltaics. They really got the ball uh, rolling even though the manufacturing was done uh, largely in China and other places. Um, uh, that, uh, that points to the importance of having large markets in order to, to sort of stimulate um, uh, cost decreases in, 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 uh, in industry. Um, Ryan, do you want to take on the rate of change question? You should talk about, uh, you should talk about the paper in the SES Center. Would you do that one too? Okay. Uh, okay, so the second question was about what have we uh, seen historically that would um, tell us that it was within the realm of possibility that the kinds of uh, rates of infrastructure change um, uh, that we're talking about here um, uh, would be possible. So I'll mention at this point a, a white paper that uh, Ryan and I and other colleagues are doing for the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is the sponsor of the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project. It should be uh, made publicly available in March, and we're gonna address some of the sort of non-technical issues uh, that we just sort of uh, touched on today, like land use, uh, uh, job creation, um, uh, and so forth. But one of the things is sort of historical precedence um, for rapid energy system transformations in the United States and also the federal role in such a transformation. And, and I would point to a few things that really changed the energy picture historically very rapidly. One was rural electrification over the period of 
uh, a couple of decades. We're talking about a 30-year transformation, right? This is what I've just shown you. Uh, in less time than that, uh, rural America went from being basically unelectrified to being virtually completely electrified. Another example is uh, nuclear power, which was also enabled by federal policy, especially the Price-Anderson Act and, and the limiting of liability for utilities. Uh, we saw uh, an extremely rapid uh, increase in nuclear power over a period of about a decade from the late 60s to the late 70s when things went awry, but in that period of time, the shape of the uptake curve of nuclear power was very similar to the shapes that uh, I've shown here today. Um, uh, so, so that will be coming out in a report. I think the, uh, maybe the best response though is while we can find some historic uh, precedents for, for rapid changes that have happened uh, in the past. Um, the point is, if we need to do this going forward, um, if we have the right collection of policies and we achieve the right market transformation, um, we'll do it because uh, we have to do it. Uh, and the idea that we couldn't do it um, seems to me to undersell um, you know, American will and ingenuity and so forth. And Ryan, real quick on the jobs. Sure, I, I can talk to the jobs. So, you know, most um, <clears throat> most of the analyses that we have contributed to and not done ourselves on on the job question show kind of modest but net positive job changes from these type of transitions. But kind of hidden within that is that they're in, in kind of within your question. These are very different jobs than we've got today, and therein kind of lies. A, a real equity question, a, a political economy question. The jobs are not necessarily in the same location. They don't necessarily re require the same educational training. Um, and that's a real issue that we need to deal with. Um, but there, you know, in the economy that we just described here, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity for employment, right? Be it manufacturing, we saw in the places where we were spending money, you know, it was new capital equipment, it was manufacturing infrastructure, uh, in places we were saving money, which were most, mostly fossil fuels. You know, the fossil fuel industry in the U.S., in terms of direct employment, is not a, you know, it's not a huge number of U.S. jobs, and there, there are a huge number of indirect U.S. jobs, you know, supported by that. Um, but, you know, the, the net jobs don't give us pause so much as just we need to be very deliberate in our uh, transition here to address the fact that there are, um, you know, some, some, you know, disparities in, in regional outco outcomes, et cetera. So. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Fiona and Bruno to come to the stage so we can get our panel discussion uh, underway. I think we'll continue to talk about, I think, some of the issues that, that have come out just in that first round of questions, um, uh, clearly probably also of concern in, in some of the uh, federal, excuse me, country level, state level, and city level uh, uh, examples that we're about to talk about. One of the really important things, I think, as Jim alluded to, is that actually enacting policies that make these transitions is not a backcasting uh, modeling exercise. It's a real life political and economic exercise, which is where you get into some of these labor and, uh, and other political issues that we've started to talk about. Um, I thought perhaps we'll start with uh, Fiona, who can talk about uh, the UK's uh, net zero emissions plan by 2050 and what they've done so far. Uh, each of our presenters will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we will uh, we'll have a discussion with them uh, at the end. So Fiona, if you're ready, then you you can take the podium and we'll get started. So Fiona Clader from our Foreign Office, our Ministry of, of Foreign Relations. Um, I'm here to give you a more general overview of the approach taken by the UK government um, towards uh, net zero. Um, and I'm also grateful to colleagues, Professor uh, Jim Skay from Imperial College, who's our representative on the IPCCC, 
um, to um, Chris Stark from our Committee on Climate Change, um, which fulfills a very similar function to, to the sort of things that Jim's been talking about, uh, and also to colleagues from our Department for Business, Environment and Environmental Strategy uh, for some of these slides. Thank you. Uh, and so, like Jim, I'm going to start with the UNFCCC um, and the fact that the IPCC was asked to produce a special report in 2018 on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees uh, above those historical levels and what does that mean on related greenhouse gas emissions. And as we all know, um, it requires major change, and, and Jim's just described many of the different sector changes uh, that we all need to be thinking about. So bringing to bear both technologies, but also different ways of living, different ways of working, different ways of transport, looking at the role of renewables, taking out coal, um, changing our, our whole energy balance but also looking at our infrastructure and really those decisions that we make now, the big investments uh, that we make are going to be even more important in terms of uh, our emissions profile over the next 30, 50 years. Ch changes in land use um, and big changes in, in how we plan uh, for all of this in our governments, in our regions, in our cities. And so uh, I've just highlighted there the reference to that report, which I think is a mine of very, very important information. And so what have we been doing in the UK? Uh, and that's really a combination of things. So we have um, the UK Climate uh, Change Act. So a very important legislative framework. Uh, and that act was introduced in 2008, so a decade ago, and at the time was the first of its kind in the world. And it made the UK the first country to introduce a legally binding long-term emissions reduction target. Um, and we set that target originally to reduce gas emissions by 80% by 2050, relative to 1990 levels. Uh, but last June, we uh, increased that commitment to go to net zero, so that reduction of 100%. We also introduced a framework of carbon budgets um, to ensure progress uh, towards that target. And those carbon budgets are currently set in legislation. They're amongst the most stringent in the world. Um, and they are um, also set on, on a five-year um, sequence, but planning ahead for the next 12, 15 years. And so, but... We recognise that whilst we've met those first two carbon budgets, we're on track to meet the third, in, which runs from 2018 to 2022. But there needs to be further action. And so we're bringing together ambitious new policies across our economy to deliver net zero and meet those carbon budgets. And that includes an energy white paper, a transport decarbonisation plan, and a heat roadmap in 2020. And to oversee some of that um, progress, um, we also very much draw on our Committee of Climate Change, uh, which is an independent statutory body, the CCCC I mentioned, and that provides expert advice to government on climate change mitigation and adaptation. So in other words, it's an independent body really holding our government to account. And elements of our approach on carbon budgets, legislation, independent advice have been emulated by other countries, including France, Denmark, Sweden, Mexico. And, but this isn't easy. As we all know, it's major changes in major sectors. Um, our uh, energy profile, greatest emissions for the UK come from transport, but also our energy supply, as well as business, agriculture, and residential. Um, and so um, the um, Committee on Climate Change has been looking at different ways in which the different sectors can address those challenges. And I'm not going to go through um, the detail of all these different sectors, but just as Jim has been describing here, experts are working on the best way to make progress in different ways that's most appropriate for the different sectors. 
uh, and there's more information about the approach on the CCC website. But the, as well as a challenge, this is also a great opportunity for all of us. And from the UK, we strongly believe this can be the growth story of the 21st century. That we can boost growth, we can boost jobs, we can spur innovation. And it's also, there really isn't a plan B. We have to go down this route um, for our future world uh, and for our future economies and quality of life. And so we have something called the Clean Growth Strategy, um, which is uh, a very uh, ambitious strategy, but it's looking at the whole economy um, through to 2032, building on the progress we've already made in decarbonizing our power sector, but it includes ambitious proposals on housing, on business, on transport, and on the natural environment. And the CCCC um, have advised the government that the Clean Growth Strategy is the appropriate framework to help drive and deliver more ambitious action. And it really focuses on those areas where we can get benefits, so cleaner air, lower energy bills, industrial opportunity, high value green jobs, an enhanced natural environment and improved quality of life. And it's at the heart of our industrial strategy, um, looking at um, how we can develop uh, different sectors, um, both developing their efficiency, the economic opportunity, um, as well as uh, jobs and impacting on wider society. And we've, the UK has world leading strength in key sectors like green finance, offshore wind, smart energy, and electric vehicles. And so this is also a very important economic opportunity. And we believe our 12 strongest low carbon sectors could contribute 27 billion pounds to the economy, both through domestic economic activity and another 26 billion through exports by 2050. So this is a real economic opportunity and where we're trying to align our clean growth and our wider industrial strategy. Um, we've talked about the legislative framework um, that I think has been very, very important um, in steering us in this direction. And we also, uh, as I say, are held to account, but believe that we are making good progress. And on the 15th of October uh, last year, so just a couple of months ago, uh, the government republished its response to the CCC's challenge, it, its latest annual progress report, um, on the actions that the government needs to take to deliver net zero, meet our carbon budgets. And as I mentioned, these include plans for publication 2020 of an energy white paper, transport decarbonisation plan, and a heat roadmap. And so we see real benefits um, from all of this, but it's very much about uh, both a cross-government approach, but also working very closely with business, um, the private sector, investors, and also wider society to get people to see uh, the benefits that can result from going down this path. And so there's some web links there on our clean growth strategy, on our industrial strategy, and crucially, the report I mentioned from last October on that we're going to really up the scale on, of our ambition. And so, um, as you can see, we've really taken a coordinated approach, um, working across government, across business, across society, to try and drive this agenda forward. We also want to further the discussion across the world and in November 2020, the UK will be hosting COP26. It will be the biggest international summit the UK has ever heard, over 30,000 delegates, both government, climate experts, campaigners, and business, um, to agree a coordinated approach on how we can all tackle climate change and how we all address the opportunities and challenges that change will bring to our countries, our regions, our cities, our societies. 
Um, so that is um, our Twitter account, uh, which will have all the regular updates on the approach that the UK is taking to COP26. Um, hope very much some of you will be at that meeting in Glasgow in November. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Fiona. I'm going to ask uh, Ryan to come up and do his presentation on, on U.S. states. Uh, Fiona, we'll ask at, uh, at, the, at the panel discussion time, though, um, one of the things I find very interesting is the record of emissions reductions that the U.K. already has. And, and in a U.S. context, um, really important to emphasize the importance of a positive industrial strategy as one of the drivers for thinking about public acceptance of, uh, of a deeper decarbonization plan. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what's actually been difficult about executing some of those policies and what you anticipate being difficult going ahead. But uh, for now, let's talk uh, with Ryan about uh, what's going on in, in U.S. states. Great. Well, thank you, um, CSIS, for the invitation, and thank you, Sarah, for inviting me here to speak. Um, let's see, where was that clicker? There we go. That'll help, yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 looks like we're, uh, we're starting over, so bear with me here. Okay, here we go. So, um, Again, my name is Ryan Jones. I'm one of the co-founders of Evolved Energy Research, and we're a small consulting shop uh, that has been doing these type of deep, deep decarbonization plans and modeling for the past four or five years. Um, I'm going to speak today with kind of my, my, uh, from my consulting experience on a state level. And over the past, I think, four years in particular, and kind of rewinding the clock to 2016, I didn't, I don't think we expected that subnationals in the U.S. would be as piv pivotal as they have for the past four years and kind of picking up some of the slack that's been left by the federal government. And I think my colleague Bruno will speak to that as well on the, on the city level. Um, but we've done, you know, over these past four years, state level plans, uh, or I've been involved in plans for, for California, Washington State, New York, uh, Florida, New Jersey. Um, I just got back from meetings yesterday in Massachusetts, and uh, uh, just acknowledgement to the Massachusetts governor, uh, Charlie uh, Baker, who just announced a net zero goal for Massachusetts night before last. So a lot is happening on the state level. Um, and I thought in my comments today, I would kind of focus on uh, what I want to call eight kind of lessons learned for state level planning or analysis. Uh, and I'm going to go through each, and I, I've got a slide for each. But in short, these are kind of, number one, start with a long-term plan. Um, number two, focus uh, early on your long-lived assets, energy uh, infrastructure. Uh, number three, acknowledge that market transformation has had a great track record. Um, number four is identify the, the no-regret strategies in the face of uncertainty. Uh, number five, assume that we all uh, eventually act collectively. Uh, six is to, to keep policy uh, nimble. Um, number seven, establish the right arenas for competition. I'll go into more detail what, what that means. And then number eight, develop strategies that can be made universal. So uh, here we go. So um, start with the long-term plan. So what we're seeing in a lot of states uh, too often in uh, requests for proposals that we respond to, or even just discussions with state officials, is that oftentimes we start with a 2030 plan where we say, okay, what do we need to, you know, what does policy need to do to get us to 2030? And there's an afterthought, they say, okay, now let's tack on to that a study of, of 2050 in our long-term goal of net zero. And, uh, you know, that's, pragmatic from a perspective of, you know, the legislature needs this report yesterday in order to make the policy, et cetera. So there are always extenuating circumstances here. But what we found is that, you know, doing that long-term plan first, starting with the end goal and working backwards to understand the intermediate years, that has been very successful and is a recipe at least for putting near-term action within the longer-term context. And California has been very successful at that in the, in the sense that, you know, when Jim and I were at E3 together, 
doing work in California, it was, we were doing 2050 studies that informed goals that were then announced for 2030 for the state. And so that's been a successful uh, uh, kind of recipe in the past. Second, focus on long-lived long assets. So this figure here um, on, the, uh, on the top left there uh, shows kind of with lifetimes how many replacements we get between now and 2050. Right, is how many bites of the apple. And you know, a lot of policy tends to focus first on low-hanging fruit and not to single out you know, light bulb programs, right? Uh, because what we care about is cumulative emissions and you know, replacing CFLs is very cost-effective. We should do it. But what this tells you is you know, we've got a lot of bites at the apple be before 2050 to get light bulbs right. Uh, looking at power plants, pipelines, commercial boilers, some of these pieces of infrastructure that receive less focus, we may have only one replacement cycle between now and 2050. So to avoid kind of carbon lock-in, uh, you want to get that policy right early, right? Um, number three, market transformation has had a great track record. So numerous successful attempts f for either national or subnational uh, bodies putting in place policies that have really kick-started industries that are now very pivotal to the overall success of deep decarbonization. So California uh, wind in the 80s, I think at one point in the 90s, California had a third of all wind installed in the world. Um, you know, German feed, of, feed in tariff in the, in the 2000s, kind of uh, buying down the cost of solar for the rest of us, right? Um, and the, the economists in the room will cringe at the second point here, but regulatory mandates successfully hide the cost, the, the marginal cost of carbon abatement, right? So if you look at, for instance, the feed-in tariff program in, in Germany, you know, I haven't done the, the math, but I'm guessing it was thousands of dollars a ton for carbon abatement from that policy. Um, but, uh, you know, that, you know, in hindsight, having done that policy and looking at the role that solar plays in our system, nobody could argue that that wasn't an important piece of policy to, to kind of put in place. So, so keep an eye on market transformation uh, is, is number three there. Identify no regret strategies. So when we do state level work, uh, we often uh, do what kind of Jim showed in his presentation, which is take, you know, take a scenario approach run a, lot, a bunch of sensitivities with things that we know to be un, uncertain in the future, technology price, fossil fuel price, et cetera. And one of the things that we're looking for always is commonalities between cases. So if we know some variable is uncertain, but regardless of, of whether it's high or low, uh, you know, finding X remains applicable, that's a really important thing to know that we can then go make policy around because we believe that result to be robust. Um, number five, assume that we act collectively. So when you do state level work, boundary conditions are, are extremely important and unavoidable, right? And, and maybe this is um, you know, a bit controversial, but I think that single states are not going to be able to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions if all of our neighbors continue on a business as usual scenario, right? And these energy systems are complex, they're slow to change, they're very interconnected, um, and this is gonna take very sustained uh, effort over the next 30 years to achieve, right? And so uh, what we find in a, in, a, in a state level policy context is oftentimes the conversation, we will be in a very small state which is embedded within a very large energy system and they'll say, well, my neighbor doesn't have any of the 80 by 50 goals or net zero goals, and therefore, uh, you know, they have, there's a go alone mentality that can have kind of some distorting effects here. And these are just some things that, we, you know, uh, we've heard in the past, you know, in this type of uh, planning from, from uh, state policymakers where, say, you know, we don't want to consider, uh, you know, transportation technology X, because you know what happens when the truck drives over state boundary and all of a sudden they can't fill up, right? So we don't want to consider that. Um, or you know we're a wealthy state and uh, you know we can buy resource Y on the international market. So 
you know, we're going to buy the, we're going to buy that, and uh, you know, this will be a lot easier for us, right? You know, of course, if everybody's trying to buy, you know, the same wood pellets on the international market to clean up their uh, own system, then you know, that's that's a problem. Um, you know, when we have too much solar, we're just going to export it to our neighbor and we're going to get paid a good price for it because we're going to be offsetting their natural gas, right? And, you know, that's, that's one from the kind of California experience that um, uh, it's never a good assumption to assume you can export solar in these uh, scenarios in the middle of the day. Uh, number six, keep policy nimble. So good state planning is an ongoing process. Uh, Technology changes, climate science evolves, uh, future uncertainty is okay. Um, we have to acknowledge the uncertainty here uh, and, and leave room for course correction. Uh, nonetheless, decisions are still necessary today, so we do the best we can with imperfect information. Uh, number seven, establish the right arenas for competition. So Jim mentioned the clean power plan and kind of trading off energy efficiency against electrification. So within the, these three pillars of decarbonization, they are all needed in, in every decarbonization plan that we to date have come up with as, as modelers and, and analysts. Um, and so competing within that for how you achieve that, that uh, goal is, is the perfect place for co competition. Um, competing between them, I think, sacrifices long-term policy clarity uh, for the sake of maybe marginal benefit in terms of economic gain. Um, and then finally here, develop strategies that can be made universal. So, you know, another experience from California uh, has been that there's, you know, there's been a significant value in taking California's experience and exporting it to, to other states. And, and other leading states like New York, we've seen the same thing. Um, so, Having a, a, a strategy that can be, re, uh, you know, replicated and and therefore exported is is great. Uh, if your strategy only works at a small scale, or if nobody else is trying to do it, it, you know, going back to the wood pellet example, it's not a great strategy, right? So great strategies get cheaper the more that we do them. You know, poor strategies get more expensive the more that everybody else does them. Um, and so those are the, the eight points there. Uh, very happy to talk about any specific questions about any, you know, any of the states that I mentioned. Uh, but that's, that's it for me, so thank you. Okay, thanks, Ryan. That's a lot of food for thought. Uh, I'm gonna invite Bruno up to do uh, his presentation now on, on the city level. Um, at, come back to you, Ryan, in the conversation about what you think about some of the kind of policy initiatives we are seeing take hold at different states and whether they fit, uh, fit your kind of eight criteria. So we'll ask Tuck. Bruno, thanks very much for being here. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Um, so um, I'm with CDP. We are uh, a you know global nonprofit. We uh, will be 20, actually, this year. And uh, we really were created with the ambition to um, transform capital markets by injecting a lot of transparency into uh, material topics that were not necessarily included in financial disclosures. We work on behalf of 550 investor signatories who collectively manage about $96 trillion in assets, so a big pot of the investable uh, money these, uh, these days, um, and with the goal of creating a systemic link between environmental information and, and financial information. Um, so we work a lot with, actually, our, our history was mostly working with, with corporations, and we, we are the main disclosure mechanism for corporate environmental data in the world with about 60% of global market cap disclosing through CDP. But we also do a lot of work with cities, uh, now working with nearly 1,000 cities globally, where about a billion people uh, live. Um, as well as uh, states and regions, but uh, today I'll speak primarily about cities. And uh, as we've heard a lot, you know, we're nearing a tipping point in environmental action, or certainly we need to be <laughs> nearing this tipping point. Uh, and uh, and cities really are at the the heart of this transition because a lot of what we've heard so far today ultimately will be driven by end use or investments coming out of, uh, of municipalities in one way or another. Uh, just to give you a sense, today again, uh, this is our 2018 data, uh, the tw uh, this map anyway, the 2019 again uh, is about 20%, 20, 25% 20, 
growth in cities uh, disclosing to CDP every year. Do you get a sense, uh, geographically, pretty good distribution. Certainly we need more in Asia and Africa. Um, uh, and these are cities of all sizes, certainly a lot of large cities, including about uh, 25 mega cities uh, uh, around the world. I mean, certainly the big ones like New York and LA, but uh, you know, places like Dhaka, Bangladesh, or Karachi, Pakistan, or so uh, really around the world, um, we are the main disclosure mechanism for groups like C40 or the Global Covenant of Mayors or other uh, entities that you may have heard of. Some of the things uh, that are worth noting, one, for example, is about the top 100 emitting cities in the world account for about 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, targeting cities is, is a good idea. Uh, in most countries, the top three urban areas drive uh, more than a quarter of their country's emissions. So again, targeting cities, uh, large cities inside of countries is, uh, is also a good idea. Uh, 41 of the top 200 uh, emitting cities actually have relatively low per capita emissions, but because of, frankly, their scale and or population. So that's why this, this focus on systems certainly matters a lot. Uh, something also to note, I won't touch on it too much today, but this idea of what we call scope three emissions or indirect emissions. So cities' emissions are not just about what is produced or emitted in the city. You know, obviously energy systems matter, but also all the production of goods and food and things that come into cities has to be part of the, uh, the conversation as well. So just to give you a sense, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned number, you know, we've, we've seen roughly where emissions tend to come from. Cities have a big role to play. Uh, uh, again, they, they account for roughly 70% of the world's uh, energy related, uh, certainly emissions. Uh, and also because most of the people who will be impacted by the effects of climate change, either currently or will live in cities by the time most of these effects come, um, and you know, one of the things we've seen with cities is they've been some of the most uh, nimble, frankly, and, and proactive uh, government entities in terms of taking action and, and, and you know, doing some uh, uh, rapid cycle testing and doing public-private private partnerships. They have that, uh, that level of, uh, of nimbleness as well. Uh, you know, some of the things we see is the more we work with them, the more uh, they do. Uh, just some, uh, some stats here, since, uh, since the Paris Agreement, we've seen nearly doubling of cities setting emission reduction targets. Uh, we've seen um, uh, a significant increase in, uh, in cities creating climate action plans. I live in Princeton, New Jersey. I actually sit on the steering committee for, uh, for the city's uh, sustainable Princeton, and we just uh, got done set, uh, doing the climate action plan for the city, so I'm uh, painfully familiar with that process as well. Um, but certainly there's, uh, there's a, still a disproportionate representation of developed uh, uh, country and high, relatively high-income cities in the disclosure pot, and what we've seen certainly is that disclosure leads to a lot of good things that we need to see more of. One example of which is um, uh, more disclosure leads to further action, and this is, uh, you know, we've been now doing this for nearly 20 years, uh, but cities for about eight years now, and what we see is there's a significant uptake in action in cities uh, at about year three of disclosure. Again, partly because by making information visible, by allowing it to be collected, by allowing uh, public consultations, city councils and mayors to, uh, to, to start acting on it. At about year three, you can see a significant uptick in things like goal setting, uh, action planning, funding of efforts, et cetera. So it's an important kind of mechanism to fuel so that action can, um, can follow. We also score our city's disclosures worldwide, um, uh, just like we do our corporate disclosures, uh, and about the top 5% or so of cities receive an A. Um, and it doesn't mean they're perfect, that just means they're, they're really front of the pack and, and demonstrating best practice. Um, uh, as you can see from the 2018 list, we haven't quite uh, released the uh, 2019 yet, uh, but about half of them uh, last year were um, located in North America. So that's a good sign in terms of what we're doing here. Certainly we need to see a lot more. As you can see, the Global South is, is relatively poorly represented. You have Buenos Aires on there, you have Cape Town, um, and then actually there's three cities in, in Taiwan that, uh, that scored A's uh, partly due to actually so, the, you know, significant uh, federal support in that case. Um, but we definitely need to see uh, more. There's not a single uh, a city in a developing country that has 
uh, achieve the NAYA, and uh, what we see is lower income communities certainly are often disproportionately affected by the risks of climate change, and we need to do more uh, to, uh, to help them move that along. What it roughly looks like, um, you know, the process to what, by which we work with cities, and, and all of this is, is available, the slides will be available, all of this is available through, through our website as well, but how we work with cities to move them from kind of the early stages of disclosure through kind of action and ultimately what it means to get to an A-level uh, uh, performance in, in cities um, is, uh, it is a progression. It doesn't necessarily require a lot of investment, but it requires certainly a lot of commitment uh, and a lot of engagement. Uh, you know, we do a lot of work with, actually because of our work with corporations and with cities, doing a lot of, uh, um, you know, for example, we have this big thing called the City, city Business Climate Alliance to really uh, help cities and their lo large local employers um, uh, you know, work together on, you know, what does it look like to, to, to act together. Uh, but certainly the um, deep decar decarbonization we're talking about um, is, is much more rare in the developing world. Uh, there are examples, and, and uh, I wanted to bring just a couple, uh, you know, Addis Abeba in, uh, in Ethiopia uh, has actually uh, targeted uh, um, emissions reductions of 64 percent by 2030 against a baseline of 2010. Certainly a, uh, a shining example in, uh, in the developing world, um, uh, as well as actually they've uh, recently uh, committed to uh, working on a net zero target. You have uh, Kampala City in Uganda, uh, again, uh, in their case, 22% uh, emission reduction uh, from their 2014 baseline against, uh, uh, by 2030, specifically targeting commercial buildings, residential buildings, and industrial facilities. Uh, then you see cities like, you know, Samarang City in Indonesia that has worked very hard to set a goal of reducing emissions by 2.96% uh, from 2013 baseline by 2030. Uh, uh, and again, you know, we, we uh, welcome this sort of disclosure because, you know, many of us would argue they need to go faster, but at least, you know, they're, they're setting a target and they're saying what it will take to at least, at least achieve that. Um, uh, in their case, also a lot of work with this kind of water energy nexus. Um, um, uh, you know, you see bigger cities from, you know, uh, Cape Town and others uh, that have set net zero targets. Um, uh, many of our uh, A-list cities have uh, uh, pledged uh, net zero. Actually, we are in uh, uh, a listed city here. Uh, Washington, D.C. is one. Actually, Arlington next door as well. Uh, uh, a few on the uh, eastern seaboard. But um, uh, just, to, uh, just to move on, I also just want to quickly highlight an example of so how do we use this information. We created this, uh, this platform called Matchmaker because in reviewing all these cities' disclosures, what kept coming up over and over and over were descriptions of projects, things that cities needed to do that they weren't necessarily finding funding for or at least needed to find funding for. And so we created a, a basically a view into these projects uh, aimed to eliminate uh, what these projects are to uh, investors and, and banks uh, to, um, to make that visible so that uh, uh, in this case, you know, you can see some of the categories. Um, but globally, we have about 391 cities that identified about 1,100 projects uh, uh, representing about $72 billion of investment. And again, just to kind of put that developing world lens on there, um, for approximately $13 billion, you could do over 500 projects in over 200 cities in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, that seems like a relatively small price point when you look actually at the scale of these projects, and in large part, because obviously some of these projects end up costing a lot less in those parts of the world. Um, but that's an example of how we make this visible to different investors. For example, there's a whole set on there. Uh, it's a, it's a subcategory for green infrastructure. So a lot of cities are trying to increase their green infrastructure, their tree cover for water retention to address urban heat island. And so we have impact investors who are specifically interested in that or stormwater management upgrades or those kinds of things. So we make that visible so that uh, aggregated pools of investors can, uh, uh, can move that along. And I'll close here just to say, um, you know, this is part of how we work with cities. Virtually all of the cities that disclose to us, just like all the companies that disclose to us, do so on a voluntary basis. They are not required to do by law. 
uh, sometimes encouraged by uh, a variety of actors, but um, the, the fact is, again, we, 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 in exchange for these disclosures, we try to bring resources, we really promote best practice sharing, we give you know, access to capital through visibility, and, um, and all of this information, all of our city's data and disclosures is, is available publicly for free at uh, data.cdp.net if, uh, if you're interested, both uh, any individual city disclosures as well as the entire data set if you want to download the, the file and, and model it. Uh, but uh, anyway, sorry I raced through a lot of information, but uh, uh, thanks for your attention. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so maybe, Bruno, to start with you, because your uh, presentation is sort of fresh on the mind, I was really struck by the amount of uh, the, the sort of dollar figure associated with the projects that have something to do with building energy efficiency retrofits. I mean, it, it's, it strikes me that that's, uh, that's one of the areas that when we sort of look into various cities' attempts to try and reduce emissions, it, it's very hard. It's very hard to, to get capital for those purposes. It, is that access to capital the thing that cities are telling you is the most difficult part about their transition, or is it something else? Is it authority? Is it policy making? Like, or is it is it really sort of you know trying to get the investment into the the kinds of policies that they they need to uh, implement? I mean, you know, at, at the end of the day, money matters, um, but uh, it's it's rarely held as the single limiting factor. I mean, we've talked about a lot of things. These kind of weird competing jurisdictional issues, right? Often a lot of the projects that cities uh, need to undertake are regional in nature, whether it's public transit system expansion, whether it's watershed level, uh, whether it's, you know, distribution of even how to rethink their urban planning. And, you know, a lot of our large cities now have a whole bunch of suburbs that are their own cities. And how do you rethink, uh, you know, some of these regional maps? And so a lot of these issues um, come up quickly in terms of who do we like to work with? So highly collaborative, um, uh, you know, even how you measure, you know, for example, I mentioned I, I live in Princeton, you know, 40% of the city's footprint is actually associated with the university. Uh, uh, Princeton is a relatively little town, so most of the people who work in Princeton don't live in Princeton. Most of the people who live in Princeton don't work in Princeton. And so even like, how do you think about, you know, where, where are your levers? What are the things you can do as a city? And so it's, it's very unique, and I think it's part of the process. But uh, uh, once you have a clear path to action, once you've brought the right partners to the table, that's when you know, funding then uh, uh, becomes more, more salient. And, and when the projects make sense, um, uh, they, tend to, they tend to find capital. Brian, you had a lot of similar themes in your presentation about sort of clarity and, and having a path and, and those sorts of things. You know, forgive me, I've just lived in Washington for too long, but sort of, you know, the the policy needs to be no regrets, it needs to be nimble, it needs to assume we all get along someday. Like, those are some those are some things that are pretty tough calls. Like, so maybe, maybe just to put some concrete elements to it, we are seeing a lot of states um, interested in clean energy standards, right? I mean, that's one thing we are seeing a number of different states pursue. They're very different in different states. They're undefined in some states, even though they have aggressive targets. How does that sort of clean energy standard uh, movement, if you will, fit in your criteria of, of good policy? Um, you know, I, I actually think it fits fairly well in the, in the, in the context of kind of don't, uh, don't compete across the pillars, but set up the right competition within the pillars. So um, by defining a clean energy standard or a renewable portfolio standard that, that, that goes out to 2050, then it you know, acknowledges that we need to be 80, 90, 100% clean in electricity, which is basically what the modeling shows. That then removes ambiguity about you know, can we do a bit more in efficiency and then maybe we don't have to do quite as much in the power sector. Uh, and that ambiguity, I think, as we've seen in the past, has been detrimental to actually making solid progress in these areas. So having a 30-year, um, you know, so, so in short, you know, a lot of these states, as you, as you mentioned, both have economy-wide targets and they have clean energy standards. And I, I actually think that that's positive when the clean energy standard is well done or well defined, right? To, 
tie in something you were talking about and to bring Jim into the conversation, I mean, one of the things I think is truly remarkable about many of these deep decarbonization scenarios is just how much uh, regional transmission infrastructure is required. And that is not, again, a, a very easy thing to do. You talked about it particularly in the importance of states having to work together because right. they can't do these things on their own. And you just talked about it in aggregate, just the sheer amount of transmission we, lines we would have to be building. Is that, I mean, how do, are, are you seeing states or regions be able to surmount that challenge because it seems important to that uh, low carbon electricity pillar? You want to mention role of federal? Is it? You want to mention the role of federal government in that? Uh, why don't you do that? Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And there are probably two, th if I was to highlight two things that states are not doing well right now, one would be transmission and the other would be electrification. And we can talk about the reasons why there. Um, but on the transmission side, um, I that is one place where I think federal authority will probably be necessary to break some of these log jams, right, unfortunately, right? Uh, but because we're talking about transborder infrastructure and because of its importance in the overall transition, that's one of the, you know, most valuable things that the federal government can do uh, is to help states site those lines and get them built. Um, you know, because a lot of the electricity transition, at least at low cost, is predicated on having some of those transmission lines, which, you know, if there's a single silver bullet strategy for dealing with high renewable uh, systems, it's more transmission. Right. Um, the, I want to highlight what I think is a best practice that's emerging from California, um, which is um, addressing some of the environmental concerns that are associated with um, with energy siting, including transmission siting. Um, and so actually my former graduate student, Grace, Grace Wu, who's now at Santa Barbara, um, uh, has been working with the Nature Conservancy and the California Public Utilities Commission and the utilities to develop an analytical approach that incorporates um, <laughs> conservation values basically for every square kilometer of the western United States developed in, in, in concert with the Nature Conservancy and other environmental organizations and puts them into the same modeling framework as the renewables planning models. So it accounts for the quality of the site in terms of its wind resource or its solar resource. Um, and. Uh, and this allows there to be, instead of a, of a sequential process where some developer goes out and says, we want to build a wind farm or we want to build a transmission line, and uh, our cost model says this is the direction we want to go in, it runs right into a lot of environmental opposition to say, you know, what about the tortoises or, you know, some other value. Instead, incorporate that up front. And so this is actually now part of the of the generation planning process for California. And so I, I think that that's something that um, is going to be, uh, need to be taken everywhere. And one of the, one of the findings of that it gets back to Ryan's point about not having state go it alone strategies. These need to be regional strategies. The federal government can certainly, uh, it's needed to play an important role and it is within the jurisdiction of the federal government, transborder stuff. But the right locus of action is actually probably regional planning of transmission. Fiona, I wanted to bring you into the conversation with, regarding some of the stuff I had asked you earlier, which is you, the UK has a, a really good sort of track record to talk about reducing emissions, growing the economy, creating jobs. Is one is the is the trajectory the, of this sort of industrial strategy, clean growth industrial strategy, too uh, consistently popular? Right? How how are people viewing these changes since you're sort of uh, uh, halfway through? And then and then I was just noting that uh, the CCC put out a, a recommendation, a set of recommendations on your agriculture and land use side of the equation, um, where the Financial Times had an interesting coverage of it, quoting the, 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 the study saying, there are actually no UK-wide policies to deal with emissions in the agriculture sector as of present. Like, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I mean, is it a, a clean slate for you to pursue that route? Or, or, or how are you thinking about the, that, that particular element of the challenge since it's the newest CCC report that's out? 
some very good questions there. So, so first of all, to answer the point is, is how well has the UK done so far? Um, we've managed to reduce our emissions by over 40% since 1990, whilst growing the economy by more than two thirds. So I think in terms of, of first of all, the challenge, um, initially I can recall a lot of skepticism um, across uh, industry, um, from wider society, when all this was first mooted as kind of, but economically it doesn't make sense. So I think actually showing it does make sense, that it is possible uh, to create jobs, to create opportunity. And also, um, in the slide I put up, it actually shows the whole, whole map of the UK in that clean growth strategy. So it's also been important, played an important role in regional transformation. Historically, our uh, ec economy has, has mainly been located in, in the south with some quite deprived areas uh, in the more northern areas uh, of the UK. And so the clean growth strategy is really looking at opportunities in all our different regions. And I think that's been very important about getting people's buy-in. Also, I think the approach taken in our industrial strategy was very much a visionary one. So this was introduced, I think, five, five, six years ago under a previous government, but has been continued so far by successive governments. And actually, it was a very brave decision because, of course, governments by their nature tend to be short-term. But these big changes we're talking about, and, and the industrial strategy not only tackles clean growth, it also looks at um, healthy aging in the changing demographics in our population. Um, it looks at uh, changing transport systems, and it looks at the advent of, of AI, artificial intelligence, and what that's going to mean for our world society of the future. So actually, it's a very brave decision by the government, I think, to take a more visionary approach. And slowly, slowly, I think um, the wider uh, economy, wider society, business have, have started to buy into that. Um, now, of course, not, not everything is perfect, and, and it certainly has challenges. But I would like to think one of the great features of the UK is, is our open debate. And so you mentioned, for example, um, the uh, advice by the Committee on Climate Change uh, just this week. I haven't seen the full detail. It's come out whilst I've been travelling, but I have seen that it's created a reaction. And so this is about recommendations that focus on sustainable land use, um, uh, changing patterns uh, in the agricultural sector. And so you have the farming community immediately up in arms about this, because this would be quite a fundamental change to the way our agricultural sector works. And historically, that's a very important part of our history, of our society, and where the farming community has, has indeed suffered uh, a great deal in, in earlier decades. So, but by making that statement, that independent body of the CCC has clearly opened up an important area for debate, for consultation. So this is not about imposing a recommendation, but it's about airing a direction of travel and exposing that to, to discussion to collectively find the best way forward. Great, thank you. I want to get our audience engaged in the discussion. I'll do the same thing I did last time, which is collect questions. If you could state your name and affiliation and question in the form of a question, we will get started right here. Thank you, Toby Gotti, TTG Global. I um, have two questions, one which goes back to some of the earlier comments, and that is that um, uh, one of your recommendations was um, uh, something that I think a lot of people in the developing world might be upset of, which was no new transport for oil and gas uh, lines because many people just don't have access and the problems with coal and cooking and air quality are really terrible. So my question is, have you had any, um, uh, because these companies also plan 10, 20 years ahead. Has there been any discussion or is this kind of recommendation just put on as something you assume will happen because of stranded assets or whatever? That's my first question. My second is on reforestation, which some of you have mentioned but not talked about. Um, what is the contribution that can be made um, by reforestation to um, uh, anything dealing with carbon um, issues and who is working on this uh, because I know some of the energy companies are now thinking that this is something they can do. Maybe it's a form of charity. I don't, I'm not sure exactly if they're, some of them are, are that serious, but I think some of them are and they're really thinking about it. And of course we have this new plan 
if it's real for planting, you know, one, two, three, many trillion trees. And I don't, I wonder how that all fits in. Hi, uh, Nader Subani, Niskanen Center. I have a question for Ryan, actually. During your presentation, you mentioned how the cost per ton of the feed-in tariff was probably pretty high, but we still view that as a successful policy. Um, but cost per ton is a metric we use to assess um, different cl climate policies. So I was wondering what other metrics might we use uh, to evaluate climate policy uh, that, that are quantifiable beyond uh, cost per ton. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Corey Combs, JLL. Um, I'm very curious about energy innovation investments. Uh, they tend to be very risky, and they tend to be very public, leading to certain public aversion in public sector investment at all levels. So to what extent can we rely on, so to speak, no regret it existing, uh, so for example, power plants? Um, versus, you know, upcoming small modular reactors, H2, things like that, that entail a certain level of risk. How should we manage that balance? Thank you. Okay, so maybe uh, on the no more oil and gas uh, transport infrastructure, that would be a good one for you to take, Jim, or, or Ryan? I'll do reforestation. Why don't you, you want to do reforestation instead? Reforestation, Jim. So um, on the, on the uh, oil and gas uh, transportation side, so... Um, this slide that, that Jim showed was specific to the U.S., so that's the first caveat to make. And, you know, I, I can't speak to every country in every circumstance as to whether or not new oil and gas infrastructure is needed. And, you know, my, my hunch is certainly some is. Um, in the U.S., the, the point is more, uh, if you look at the volumes of liquid and gaseous fuels, uh, in those Sankey diagrams that Jim showed between now and 2050, if we are on this straight line path, we are declining in every year from here to 2050 in terms of the total you know, volume of, of petroleum uh, and natural gas that we're moving. And so you know, that's also not, to, you know, we need to acknowledge that there is some infrastructure that's moving oil and natural gas in 2050 that's still you know, that's still needed and that those assets still need to, you know, have value. Uh, and so maintenance and that type of thing is, is important too. But just as a, as a general principle, um, most of the kind of long distance pi pipelines that, w you know, we would look at in these type of scenarios end up being stranded over a 30, 40 year asset lifetime. And does it, can I just ask a question? Because I think one of the difficulties uh, is because you're, you, you're sort of modeling for one outcome, which is emissions mm -hmm. reductions, but there's also a ton of switches in the pipeline infrastructure in the United States right now just because of the location of production and supply. You do, do you model down to that level of granularity, or is it really that doesn't become a primary consideration? No, we we don't get into the level of modeling flows through through pipelines, you know, within this work. So certainly there is there is detail there yet to be explored. Yeah. So yeah, reforestation is very important. Um, so uh, our work, as we mentioned, uh, looks at energy and industrial CO two. It's about eighty percent, but that leaves uh, non CO two greenhouse gas emissions, methane, nitrous oxide, and so forth. Uh, from fertilizer, industrial processes, et cetera. And it also uh, leaves um, uh, the, um, the land sector, and specifically the, the land sink. So um, uh, our net CO2 emissions are the gross emissions uh, currently minus whatever goes into um, biomass and, and ultimately into soils. Um, and growing that is one way to bring down our total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, with the current numbers, approximately uh, 1,250 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents in non-CO2 gases, and the sink is currently about minus 750 million tons. And so uh, at the current level, there's an additional 500 million tons net coming from those two sources. If you don't mitigate those, then even if you're at net zero 
with your energy and industrial, you are still not net zero otherwise. And so that's actually how we chose our minus 500 million ton case was to compensate for that. Um, and get to a net zero in, in total greenhouse gas emissions. And um, the biggest single uh, contribution to mitigation. Um, uh, another another uh, look at that would be what if you were able to increase the land sink by 50% and decrease the non-CO2 gases by about 10%, which is considered pretty, uh, pretty ambitious actually in that area, then you would end up uh, uh, eliminating that that component and then if you could do a net negative scenario in energy and industrial that's consistent with the drawdown but the point is the single biggest factor in doing this land sink mitigation is in in the forestry arena there are other areas as well soil management agriculture and so forth uh, but it turns out to be very important in terms of your overall emissions Fiona and Bruno, I wanted to ask if uh, both reforestation or innovation investments play a role in uh, the UK or some of the city level policies that you're looking at. You want to start, uh, Fiona, and then we'll go to Bruno. Okay. So um, I think what, what is a really important change um, in the last couple of years in which we're starting to see momentum gather is the tying in of the business community, uh, financial systems, investment houses into this whole agenda. And I'm sure many of us saw, for example, the recent announcement by uh, the CEO of BlackRock of, of the importance of changing investment strategies. And so in the UK, um, we've had Mark Carney, uh, the governor of the Bank of England, he'll step down from that role at the end of this month, but he has been appointed uh, to, as a special advisor to the UN on climate action finance. And I think that's a very important job title that's sending an important signal to us all and also in the last week it's been confirmed that he will be advising our Prime Minister uh, on the financial aspects of this very important agenda. Um, uh, the Prince of Wales um, has also set up a very important initiative, uh, Action for Sustainability, um, involving the City of London uh, and all the main financial experts there. So I think we're starting to see a real mobilisation of that community to address this whole sustainability agenda. And it's by working together and ultimately, um, perhaps we, we all, all need to realize whilst we all, as it were, want to save the planet, that money does make the world go round. We, we need our, our economies to thrive, improve quality of, peop uh, improve quality of life for citizens, uh, and that needs investment. Um, and then the innovation side of this, that's a very important part of uh, the UK identity and economy, um, where we have many, many uh, leading scientists, technology companies, but also the legislative framework, uh, and again, the financial support mechanisms to really drive that. So harnessing that creativity and expertise towards this agenda is also a key approach of our strategy. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll touch on a few things. I mean, there are a lot of interesting relationships between these various questions. You know, one is, what is business doing? And actually, that's kind of the core of what we do at CDP about, you know, again, about 60% of global market cap uh, represented in the companies that disclose to us. That includes most of the cement companies in the world, heavy industry, metals and mining, shipping. And so they're all disclosing in a great level of detail what they're doing globally. So across a bunch of different jurisdictions and what their plans are, we now have about 750 large companies that have set uh, what is called a science-based target so that they align their rate of decarbonization across their value chain in alignment with basically the, uh, the IPCC guidance. And so there's uh, a lot for us to actually combine between what we're seeing in terms of the corporate voluntary disclosure pathways uh, or the decarbonization pathways, how that maps up to either country level MDCs or, or some of these regional things. I think that question about, you know, ultimately what do you count or what do you measure to know if, if you're making good decisions? You know, I used to work in the energy sector before uh, CDP and got pretty involved in all these, uh, these controversies around these things called ZEC programs, the zero emission credits to try to basically shore up the existing nuclear portfolio because it just, it can't compete dollar for dollar with power generation today 
but it's like, okay, do we pour, you know, the state of New York put, uh, what, eight or nine billion dollars into a program and said, okay, you know, we want to keep this nuclear capacity online because right now it's, it's the cheapest way to keep that much uh, carbon-free generation on. It doesn't necessarily make financial sense on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis if you, you compare it to something else, but it's one of those things where just that pure net cost, in this case of whether it's a megawatt hour or, or a ton of carbon, was part of the conversation, but certainly not the whole conversation, the, you know, thousand plus jobs in, in kind of sensitive counties for Governor Cuomo matter too. I mean, all these things matter. Um, and I think that question about energy innovation and, and innovation in general is really important. You know, when, when I was, I, I worked for NRG Energy and we were looking to deploy new types of, for example, uh, uh, fast start gas uh, plants in uh, in California in specific reliability pockets in Ventura County and those kinds of things that we thought made a lot of sense for the next 10, 15 years, but those assets typically have a payback period of, you know, 30 or 40, and so how do you have that conversation with those jurisdictions of, you really need this asset for the next 10, 15, we tend to deploy capital on a different time scale, you know, how can we collaborate on making the economics work so that, you know, capital can be deployed. I mean, you know, we all feel comfortable, you know, buying the latest iPhone, knowing that as soon as we buy it, it's outdated, but maybe in a couple of years, will change. I think the slide Ryan was showing about how many bites of the apple do you get, the bigger the thing is, right? Even electric cars. I mean, a lot of people that we talk to are like, uh, yeah, but they're gonna keep, better, keep getting better and cheaper, and that's gonna be true for the next 15 years. So do we keep waiting for it to get better and cheaper, or do we incentivize early adopters and give them some kind of way, either through subsidized lease programs? So there's, I think, you know, policy design and the, this broader political economy question keeps coming up of how do you bring business to the table and create kind of win-win solutions that in, invite early capital deployment, uh, knowing that there's a lot of uncertainty uh, that you need to mitigate. Yeah. Brian, I'm going to ask you to um, comment on the, the question about how do you measure these things and on, on not, not maybe cost per ton is not necessarily the way we should be thinking about it because it's not necessarily the way life works. But I, I also just want to mention we did a big project here at CSIS over the course of the last year called Energy in America, which was looking at some of the things that were motivating local level energy related policies. Innovation was huge. It was, I mean, creating innovation clusters throughout the course, you know, throughout the United States, trying to attract innovation dollars while you're making a, a sort of a low carbon transition was a very big part of the discussion. I'm not sure we're excellent at it, but locating, you know, innovation clusters near cities where you've got sort of core competencies was certainly a thing that was, uh, that was what most, uh, many states had, you know, had on their minds, so, so I think that was a big part of the discussion. Um, Ryan, I think it's going to be the last question, so we'd love to hear your answer to how we should be measuring these things. Sure. So um, <clears throat> just to give a couple of examples, I, you know, I think one approach that I've seen um, implemented that at least, where, you know, in theory works well is kind of assessments of impact assuming su success, and this is, you know, RPE takes this approach. Um, uh, uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures um, takes this approach where, you know, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, I think their criteria is, you know, if company Y succeeds, will it reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by a gigaton or more, or more, right? And, and so I think there are two metrics there. One is kind of impact or what, what, what does it do to your ability to reduce carbon, and the other is cost. What does it do to the cost of the overall transition? And I think, so focusing on that end point and saying if, you know, the market transformation policy that I'm considering, uh, if it's successful and it does what we hope, if that turns out to be a really important wedge within that overall 2050 energy mix, then that is its own criteria for success, right, beyond marginal dollar per ton on a, on a near-term basis. Um, just one other comment here about innovation. Uh, and I think, you know, by virtue of Jim's presentation, we focused more on the things that we know and less on the kind of outstanding research questions. And one of the emphasis that we like to place is on existing technology to make this transition achievable. There are a lot of questions post-2030, I think, related to, uh, you know, in particular the fuels questions that Jim showed. Um, some of the things like small modular reactors and others uh, you know, the scale of the challenge that we have to tackle and the pace that we need to start, uh, 
is such that those, most of those technologies, I think we see them playing a bigger X factor role in the, in the 2035 to 2050 timeframe as they ramp. Uh, and that the R&D over the next 10 years is a really important component there that maybe Jim didn't emphasize on that, you know, what we need to do over the next 10 years, but I, w I would definitely highlight that. Well, there's a lot more that we could talk about in, because this is just such a very large uh, topic, but I want to thank each of you for your presentation today, for being here for the discussion. You also did us a great favor of throwing out a whole bunch of additional resources. We'll put your slides and uh, some of those additional resources on the website so that people who watched or people who attended today can go back and do some more research on these topics. Um, I want to say a big thanks to Stephen Nimoli uh, on our team who helped put this together and is helping to curate the entire series as well as the rest of our